Hallelujah. We could worship all night, but I think I must at least share some of the word of God. Amen. I must at least share some of the word of God. And it's a joy and a pleasure for me to be here tonight. I want to thank our senior reverend and his wonderful wife, the Manivis, for having me here. I was actually just meant to sneak into Job again out. <laughs> But they decided that I couldn't just sneak in and out, that I needed just to come and fellowship with the saints. And so I bring bishop, I, I bring greetings from the presiding bishop, who is your who is your bishop, because you are the international churches. I'm standing here, but I shouldn't really, because I'm now I've now been banished to the southern region. And I also the southern region of Zimbabwe. I also bring greetings from the southern region of Zimbabwe. To all of you, I want to acknowledge all our uh, as reverends and pastors, Rev Matura, um, my Mkwenyana here and his wife. <laughs> now, I, I don't know which role. <laughs> so let me say, so let me say, for DC, the Kundus, uh, our, our, my beautiful pastors, oh, Pastor Knight and his lovely wife, Vaita, the Mbofus, and my, my dear friends over there. So glad to see you all, all the pastors. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. It's, it's a joy. And just, just, to, just everyone who's taken time, I know that this is the middle of the week. You are all at work. And I promise I won't keep you beyond 8 o'clock. And I'm so blessed that we have such a sweet anointing now of the Holy Spirit here today. So I've, I feel a confirmation of the word that I'm about to share. Um, because we all know that um, Jesus Christ walked on the face of the earth. And that was the dispensation of Jesus Christ. But when he left and he went back to the Father, he said he will not leave us comfortless. He said he would not leave us as orphans, but that he was going to send one who was going to represent him, one who was going to teach us about him, one who was going to walk with us and one who was going to lead us. And so tonight I want to talk to you about a facet of the Holy Spirit that we should all be enjoying as believers. We know that when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we should be having discernment, that we should be having a perception that is above and beyond that of the ordinary person. We all know that as women, we, women have what is called intuition. Women have that ability to see things that other people cannot see. I know that many times even as husbands, maybe you've heard your wife saying, maybe you, you're about to take a certain course of action. And then your wife says to you, I don't think you should do that. And then you ask her why, and she can't tell you why. She just says, no, I just don't feel we should do that. <laughs> do you know what that is? It's, a, it's, it's called perception. It's called discernment. And I believe that it shouldn't only be women who are walking in discernment. I believe that all of us as believers should have a certain spiritual perception and we should have a, 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 you know, a certain level of discernment. And so that, that, that's what I'm going to talk to you about briefly because I believe that as believers and in the times that we are living in, we cannot operate fully without this higher level of discernment and perception because there are many things that are taking place in the spirit. And I'm, and I'm so surprised that many believers can't even discern the season that we are living in. They can't discern the things that are happening in the spirit. I want to say to you that the spirit world is actually even more real then you are to me and, that, and I am to you. The spirit world is very, very, very real. But many of us cannot perceive the spirit world. And we cannot perceive the workings of the spirit realm. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you about the eye. Not just the eye, but the spiritual eye. Matthew chapter 6 verses 22 to 23 reads, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I think they have the scripture there. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? It's the Nariswas. You know, these days my, my, I, I, I seem to, to be forgetting things that I shouldn't be. <laughs> when I want to recall something, I think it's the. <laughs> 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 
But anyway, forgive me. <laughs> just in case you think, but how can mom forget us? Forget our name? No, I haven't forgotten you. It's just the age that's catching up. <laughs> so when I want to recall things, they sort of like slip away. But let's forget about that. Now we're talking about what? We're talking about the eye. So he says, if your eye be evil, what does that mean? It means that if your eye is bad, or if your eye cannot see properly, I'm not talking about the physical eye, because there's the physical eye and there's the spiritual eye. But there are many believers whose spiritual eye is not developed. It's underdeveloped. Or it's not functioning as it should. Then Leviticus 21 verses 17 to 23, it reads, Speak to Aaron saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of God. These were the priests, the sons of Aaron. Okay, let me read your, your version. We're reading up to, verse, up to verse 23. Can you move to the next verse? It says, For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. Number one, what is the first man that couldn't approach? A what? A blind man. What did that mean? It meant that that man's eye was evil. He had a defect in his eyes. He couldn't see. And because he couldn't see, he couldn't minister. Or a lame, or he that had a flat nose, or, or anything superfluous. The next verse. Or a man that is broken-footed or broken-handed. The next verse. Or a crook, a crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish where? In his eye. So if you were blind, or you had a blemish in your eye, you could not come before God. You could not come into the presence of God. You could not serve. You could not minister in the presence of God. Amen. Then Revelations 3 verses 18 to 19. And it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest what? That thou mayest see. So God doesn't only want to cover your nakedness. God wants to anoint your eyes with eye salve, so that you may see and you may perceive what it is that is happening in the spirit realm, the things that are happening and taking place around you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the eye is a vital organ when we're speaking about it in the natural. I often think that if I was asked to sacrifice any organs of my body, I promise you I'd give my hand, I'd give my leg, I'd give my, my, my ears, I'd give my nose, I'd give my lips if necessary. But please don't take my eyes away. <laughs> I could sacrifice the things that, that so, the, the so-called things that make you look beautiful, but please don't take my eyes. That's how important eyesight is. But today I, I don't know, only want to talk to you about the natural eye. I want us to talk about our ability to be able to see in the spirit. We are going to look at our eyes in totality. Very quickly, what the Collins English Dictionary defines eyes as. It says it is an organ of sight. It is the ability to see. It is attention. When you want to get someone's attention, you ask them to see something. It is the ability to judge. Do you know that your ability to judge is your ability to see? Yet there are many people who cannot judge. There are many people who cannot assess situations. Why? Because they can't see. It is to understand. It is to perceive with the eyes of the mind or the spirit. It is that discernment or the prophetic inclination. I know that not all of us are prophetic. Not all of us are prophets. But every single child of God should have a prophetic inclination. You should be able to judge and to see things for what they really are. It is to understand. It is to watch. That is why the Bible says that we should what? We should watch and pray. But not many of us watch. Many of us pray, but how many of us watch? Because remember the Bible says that we should be what? We should be as a watchman. We should be as a watchman on a, on a wall, set on a wall. And it says he's calling for watchmen. Can you imagine a city in, in, in those days, the cities used to have walls. 
and on those sit and, and on those walls, those thick walls, they would have a watchman. And what would the watchman do? The watchman would be scanning the horizon, watching to see if there were any enemies coming, watching to see if there was any danger. And he would quickly report to the city if there was anything that was coming. There are many of us as believers who find ourselves in situations. We find things having happened without our knowledge and we, we are often taken by surprise because we are not watching. We have not developed that spiritual eyesight. It is to make sure of something. I often look at young ladies who just fall into relationships. Just the other day, a very mature person whispered to me, says, Mama sends a chapter. You know, we haven't seen the person. That person hasn't been introduced to anyone. They're just going to get married. Has that person made sure of the person that they're going to get married? Do you make sure of things before you make decisions? Do you ask God to show you? Or do you just jump in and find yourself having done stuff? It is to consider or decide. Before you make that decision, do you consider? Do you ask the Holy Spirit to help you? Do you ask the Holy Spirit to show you the hidden things? Sometimes it, it is also to have experience of. Have you ever seen someone that experiences something? They now say, oh, now I see. <laughs> Sometimes you can't see something, you can, only see, you can only see it after you experience it. But I pray that many of you will not see things only after you have experienced them. I pray that you will see them and not have to experience them. What else is to see? It is foresight. Many people like to go to Sangomas. The people that don't know the Lord, they, they go to Sangomas. Why? Why do they go to Sangomas? They are looking for foresight. They want to see into the future. But you and I don't need a Sangoma. We have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can give us that foresight. I often say even, even for parents, pray for your children so that you can see things before they happen. Some of us who are older, we have children that are living in other countries, children that are living far away. This is the ability that you need to have. The foresight. So that you can start to pray for things before they even happen. The Holy Spirit can just give you a burden. Just, 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 two, just, two, just two Sundays ago, I just had a, you, you know, just a nagging feeling where you just feel, just feel uneasy. And I just thought, you know, usually when I feel like this, I, I need to pray in tongues. And so I was just moving around the house and I was just praying in tongues and I was just praying. I couldn't understand. I was just praying in tongues. And then my sister's daughter from in, 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 in Norway just phoned and says, Auntie, I'm having a, a very bad asthmatic attack. So I think that's why God was having me to what? To pray. That's the foresight that I'm talking about. I remember one day just immediately after Tuesday prayer, I was driving out and I was, I, I, I was, I got to, to some traffic lights and I was meant to filter and turn right. And there was a, a heavy vehicle, big truck coming from the same direction, but it was indicating that it's turning left. And so usually what would happen, the correct thing would be for that person to turn left and for me to turn right. But as I got to those traffic lights, something said to me, just a voice inside of me said, don't proceed, stop. Don't proceed, stop. And as I stopped, that vehicle just came straight, just came rolling straight on. It never turned left. Can you imagine if I had turned in, in front of that vehicle? I would be history. Those are the kind of things that I'm talking about. If we are children of God, that should be how we live. We should be able to see into the spirit. Our spiritual eyes should be honed. Our spiritual eyes should be polished. Our spiritual eyes should be, should be sharp. But let me just give you a few reasons why our eyes, our spiritual eyes are not sharp. I'm not going to do the whole message because the message is very long. So spiritually, 
What is sight? It is the eyes of vision. It is perception. It is good judgment. It is discernment. So that we can operate in wisdom and enjoy the good kind of success. The God kind of success. Pastor Julie was laughing this morning when she said she heard me saying in above rubies that your life must make sense. Some people's lives don't make sense. Do you know why their lives don't make sense? Because their eyes are not sharp. Your life doesn't make sense because you don't have the discernment to make good decisions, to make sound decisions, to do things that God wants you to do. You do things from your own mind, from your own understanding, and then you find yourself in trouble. Scripture clearly states that if the eye is good, the whole body is full of light. It's not only full of light, but there is illumination. If the eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. In other words, you are handicapped. Right, so now let's look at the, the types of eyes. The types of eyes that believers have. And as I've said, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to do two or three and then we're going to bring this to a close. Maybe another time when I come to Joburg again. <laughs> the first eye, and this is the eye that really hurts a lot of believers, that causes you to even have serious damage in the eye, is called the judging eye. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Read, look at the next verse. Can you imagine? It talks about judging. Then what, what does it, it then immediately talks about the why? About the eye. Would you think that judging has anything to do with the eye? It does. It has a lot to do with your spiritual eye. <laughs> so if you are judgmental, your spiritual perception is, is distorted. Straight away. It says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? I like this version that says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eyes? The amplified version says, The telephone pole that is in your eye. <laughs> Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eyes and overlook the plank in your own eye? Hypocrite. People think that hypocrites are those that come to church and pretend. No. Hypocrites are those that come to church and judge. Hypocrites are those who come with distorted spiritual vision. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's, brother's eye. The judging eye has distorted vision. Why does it have distorted vision? Because they put themselves on a pedestal. You then judge yourself wrongly. You perceive yourself wrongly because you know what? your eyesight is already distorted because you've got this big telephone pole that is in your own eye. And you're trying to remove the speck, in that, the very small speck in your brother's eye. And as you do, do so, you have a telephone pole like a and you are hurting everybody in the church because you have this big pole in your own eye and you are judging everyone. It's very strange that the people that judge are the ones that have the worst faults. That's what I've really found. Because they cannot see themselves. They cannot see themselves in the light of the Holy Spirit. They cannot understand their own faults and failings. And because they cannot understand their own faults and failings, they then magnify everybody else's faults and failings. Because they are seeing wrong, their eyes are distorted. They probably squint in the spirit. They seeing double. <laughs> so the judging eye suffers from impaired seeing and other people's mistakes are magnified people with judging eyes forget their own faults and failings and magnify the faults of others a person possessing a judging eye is extremely critical of others and cannot see their faults whenever I see a person who's very critical I know there's something wrong with the, 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 the eye there's something wrong with their perception there's something wrong with their judgment they see the speck in somebody else's eye and forget the plank and the log in their own eye. Let's look at the second eye. The second eye is the vengeful eye. There are many people who have vengeful eyes. Eyes that should be seen in the spirit, but they are full of vengeance. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 8 to 9. 
And he says, And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And what does it say? And it says, And Saul eyed David from that day forward. <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> what is that? That is the vengeful eye. There are many believers who have a what? Who have a vengeful eye. They're in the house of God, but they have what? Vengeful eyes. So if you look at the story of Saul and David, Saul was initially impressed by the young man, and he loved him very much. He even invited him to the palace. He had a good, clear eye towards David at the time. And there's many people who come into the house of God. They come and they are excited. They have a good, clear eye towards the reverends and the reverend's wife. They have a good, clear eye towards all the leaders in the house of God until something happens. Until something small happens. What happened? What, what changed Saul's eye towards David? All it took was just a song. Just a song by some foolish ladies. You know, women, women can be very silly. It was just a group of foolish ladies who sang, and it wasn't even true. What thousands had David killed? <laughs> and they came and they were dancing with the tambourines and they were saying, David killed his thousands and Saul has killed a thousand. And Saul thought, what? Just that small statement changed his perception of David. Changed the way he looked at David. And all of a sudden it says that he eyed David. His judgment of David's actions after hearing the song changed. Do you see what happened? His judgment changed. And have you noticed that when someone does something wrong to you, just a very small thing, your judgment towards that person changes. So it says from that day he eyed everything that David did and said was now, it was now changed completely. What had seemed good to him now seemed evil. You come into the house of God, you are excited about being a member of HHI, you love your pastors, you love the leaders, and something small happens. And all of a sudden, your eye changes. Everything that everybody does, everything that everybody says, Aksam Nandi, nothing is good. Everything becomes bad. So distorted was Saul's vision that he even took a javelin and once threw a javelin at David to kill him, and the young man had done nothing to him. Do you see the, important of having, the importance of having a good eye? Because when your eye is bad and you have that vengeful eye, even people who are good to you, people that love you, people that desire the very best for you, you'll not be able to see it. You'll not be able to see it. That pastor that you believed once loved you, he will become your arch enemy. The brethren whom you thought were on your side will suddenly seem like enemies. The wife that you once loved will suddenly seem like an enemy to you in the home. Why? Because you have a vengeful eye. Saul lost perspective of the situation and what he did to David. The penalty did not correlate the action. Beware of the vengeful eye. It clouds your judgment. And once your judgment is clouded, I can assure you, you'll not be able to discern even dangers and things that are coming your way. Time is gone. I'm going to talk about the evil eye. I'm going to talk about the evil eye. Proverbs 28 and verse 22. It says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. <laughs> Did you see that, Bazalot? He that hasteth to be what? To be rich hath what? Hath an evil eye. And because your, your eye is now evil, you cannot see that poverty is going to come upon you because of the, the wrong things that you are doing to get rich quick. I remember there was a time in Blauai where, the, where there was a company, I can't remember the name of the company, but that man took people's houses <laughs> because he told people that he would take their money and he would multiply it. And in no time, these people would be rich. So people gave him their houses, they gave him their money. So it's called Geozim. And they lost everything. Why? Because they had an evil eye. They wanted to be rich. And because they had an evil eye, their judgment and their perception and their discernment was affected. Matthew 7 verses 20 to 23. And he said, That which cometh out of a man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts, 
adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and a what? And an evil eye. Can you please get that scripture quickly, son? I think it's Mark 7 verse 23. Mark 7 verse 23. It says, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. So what comes out of a man? All these things, murders, envies, fornications, but what? An evil eye. <laughs> what does an evil eye do? Yeah, there we are. And all these, no, okay, the previous verse, verse 22. It says thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and what? An evil eye. So what happens? You, your judgment is now evil. Your discernment is now what? Evil. Because you are what? You are rushing to be rich. Have you seen people that rush to be rich? They make, they make foolish decisions. They get involved in all kinds of get rich, rich quick schemes, pyramid schemes. They, they, they steal. Some even kill. They'll bribe. They'll do all manner of evil because they have what? They have an evil eye. An evil eye is characterized by envy, jealousy, and the desire to acquire things by hook or by crook. Taking people's spouses, bribery, buying things back door, smuggling, stealing, lying, cheating to benefit. An evil eye is competitive and will cause people to lose their consciousness and fear of God. You're no longer conscious of God. And because you're not conscious of God, you've lost the fear of God. Guess what happens? You develop an evil eye. And when you develop an evil eye, you are finished. Your judgment is not the judgment of God. Your judgment is not led by the Holy Spirit. You no longer have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I often say that wisdom is the ability to understand the consequences of your actions. Are we together? That's all wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability to understand the consequences of your what? Of your actions. So when people don't understand the consequences of their actions, they do foolish things. And when you do foolish things, you're not wise. <laughs> then there's the offending eye. And then I'm going to bring this to a close. No, let me, let me not do the, I'll do the blinded eye. I think the, the blinded eye is, is more serious. Deuteronomy 16, verse 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of righteousness. Are we together? It says for a what? For a gift does what? It blinds the eyes of the what? Of the wise. So in other words, the wise people have a kind of vision and perception that foolish people don't have. <laughs> and, that, and those are the eyes that we should, we should all be striving for. But those eyes can only come when you have the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you and directing you. But then if you then fall and start to take gifts that's not really a gift. That is a bribe, aren't it? <laughs> Because a gift that blinds your eyes is a what? It's a bribe. I've received many gifts, but they have not blinded my eyes. Yeah. But a gift that blinds your eyes is a what? It's a bribe. So it says that you will not be a respecter of persons as well. What is, what is a respecter of persons? You know those people that, that judge others. You know these are high class. They class. I always say you are foolish. In fact, what is the class anyway? What, what, what is all this nonsensical social classes? That's, that's, God is not interested in all those things. In God's eyes, we are all the same. We are all his children. So if you become a respecter of persons, it shows what you have a what? You have a blinded eye. And you are not wise. You have a blinded eye and you are not wise. And if you begin to receive these gifts that come in what? They blind the eyes of the wise. So in other words, the eyes of the wise see things that other people do not see. 
They see into the spirit and they understand things that other people do not understand. Deuteronomy 20. When the eyes are seeing and the ears are hearing. And what are you hearing? You should be hearing the Holy Spirit speak. But many people don't hear the Holy Spirit speak. They hear the voices of the world. They hear the voices of other people. They hear the voices of the devil. They hear the voice of fear. They hear the, they, they hear the voice of defeat. Yet he says he has given us what? A heart to perceive. What is to perceive? To perceive is to understand. Eyes to see. Not, not just to see this on the surface, but to see beyond the surface. I recall that before I had started developing this skill, people used to come and they used to lie to me. People used to come and take me for a ride because I have a, I have a very compassionate heart. People would come and they would tell me long, short, sob stories and I would fall for it when the person was lying through their teeth. Yet now, when people come to tell stories, I can tell this one is lying to me. <laughs> without them, without them even, I can, just, I can just feel inside of me that I am being lied to. I am being deceived. I am being taken for a ride. I know. Why? Because I can now perceive. Amen. You are speaking words, but I'm feeling your heart. You're speaking words, but I'm what? I'm feeling your heart. My children even say to me, sometimes, mommy, you, 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 you feel too much. And I said, yes, it's important. I must feel too much. Because they know that when they come and they try to tell me sob stories, I can see through it. So it, don't come and try and tell me sob stories because I'll feel you. Sometimes you can, people come to me with heavy hearts and I can feel. All of a sudden I feel a heaviness and I know that this person has a heavy heart. People come to me and they're sad and I can feel, I can just look at your eyes and I can tell this person is carrying a burden. This person has a heavy burden. This person is sad. Sometimes people come to you and they have evil intentions and you can't tell. given you a heart to perceive eyes to see and ears to hear that's when you're able to read in between the lines someone's saying something but you can tell there's an underlying thing here someone is pretending and you can feel there's an underlying thing blinded eye has poor judgment very poor judgment I remember there was a young lady that I once knew who now had four kids four kids with different fathers and at the end she believed she was cursed and in my heart I knew she wasn't cursed I knew she just had a blinded eye you can't fall in love with a man and have a child he leaves you another one comes he tells you he loves you you have another child he leaves you the third one comes, he tells you, he loves you, you have another child, he leaves you. Aye, what would they? If the donkey, if the donkey kicks you once, it's the donkey's fault. But if the donkey kicks you twice, <laughs> oh, hey, when you blinded, just if a man just comes and says, I love you, Susan, I'm done. Come on, guys, your life must make sense. <laughs> it must make sense. <laughs> Where's the sense in that? <laughs> what is that? That heart does not perceive. And I mean, sometimes a man will just tell you he loves you because he's full of lust. He doesn't really love you. He just, he just has lust. That's all it is. We're so zalum to out of lust. No, it's, it's your fault. You have a heart. God's given you a heart to perceive, but that heart can't perceive it. As soon as it says, I love you, it's finished. So pale when I feel so you are now married to you. Yet the man is just looking for relief. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. I perceive. to see and ears to hear. These people continuously blunder around making mistakes through poor judgment, 
foolishness. And many times this blinded eye is as a result of an unteachable spirit and failure to create gradients to the wise, the more experienced and the more anointed. Ah, for this time is gone. Ah, for this I have to end. <laughs> There's more, lots more. One more. <laughs> What shall I do? The mocking eye or the self-righteous eye? Let me do the mocking. The mocking, no, the mocking, the mocking, the mocking eye, the mocking eye. <laughs> no, you've got to go home. It's work tomorrow. <laughs> the mocking eye, Proverbs 30 verse 17. This mocking eye is a very dangerous eye. Have you found the scripture, young man? Proverbs, Proverbs 30 verse 17. It says, the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall what? Shall eat it. I'll read that again. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. What is the mocking eye? The mocking eye is the eye that is lofty and haughty. You have people that come into the house of God with a, a mocking eye. They come, and everything is beneath them. Everything is below them. When the word of God is being preached, they are judging. Even as I speak right now, they are mocking. The mocking eye despises correction. They leave the church. Six weeks, eight weeks. They despise correction and rebuke. The mocking eye sets itself up as a standard. How many of you have seen those kind of believers? They know how to pray. Mm. See, now when my prayer meetings are not good, oh, nah. oh, oh, oh. Yeah. you are anointed. Mm. They have those secret prayer meetings that no one knows about. I remember once I fell into one by mistake. <laughs> there was one taking place at City One, and I didn't know about it, but I don't know how they put my name in there by mistake. And I was very quiet. I didn't, I didn't even acknowledge that I had been put. I just wanted to see who was in the group and what was happening. And they discovered after a while that they had put me in there. But, but those are the people that have a mocking eye. You'll find that when the church calls for, 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 for Tuesday prayer meeting, they don't come. We call fasts. I saw there was a fast that was called. Is it sometime in November? You find that they never fast, but they have their own fasts. Mm. Hey. ITPL, they never come. Because when they know too much. They don't even listen to their natural parents. For those of you who don't listen to your, your mother may be Emma Kaya Cholo Chokonale. She's your mother. She knows more about life than you ever will with your PhD. Mm. Or your DVD. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> DVD. They, the mocking eye is rebellious and it will not obey. Therefore, I will read it again. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out. And In other words, your eye is going to be picked out. You will be blind. Listening to your natural parents. Listening to your spiritual parents. Listening to authority figures. There are some people who just have problems with authority figures. Any authority figure they have a problem with. What's going to happen? It will be plucked out and you'll be blinded. And when you are blinded, you'll be blundering around. Before I married Bishop, before I even got into a relationship with him when I was, as a young lady, I didn't go behind my, my leaders and start doing my underground. I didn't do that. I told him, I said, if you want to be in a relationship with me, I'm taking you to my pastors. I, at that time, I was at, I was at youth, youth with a Mission. And I said to him, I'm taking you to, taking you to my leaders. And my leaders have to talk to you for me to understand who you are. I didn't know him. I had just seen him at church, but I didn't know him. Good thing he was in church, but I didn't know him. I was only 19. What did I know about life? What could I judge? 
So I took him to my lead, and my leaders interviewed him. And I was prepared that if they said to me he, was, he wasn't a good guy, I wasn't going to get into the relationship. But some of you are so desperate. You are so, so, so. If the guy says to you, yeah, let's do our thing, don't tell anybody. We are Lalela. And then he takes advantage of you. Then the donkey will kick you four times. I was ready and I was willing not to get into the relationship if my elders had judged him not to be suitable. Why? Because I didn't have a mock. I didn't want to have a mocking life. Why would I mock the judgment of my leaders? And here I am, I forty years later, still married to the same man. It'll be forty years next month. What is the eye that we should have? I was going to talk about the self. The self-righteous eye is powerful, but I'm not going to read it. I'll just read the scripture. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 12 to 13. Let's read the scripture, and then I will, I'll just tell you that the Proverbs say that, that this eye is like a giraffe. These people behave like giraffes. They have their necks high up there. They are higher than everyone. They eat the shoots that everybody else can't eat. They see what everybody else can't see, and they look down at the rest of us. <laughs> Long necks like giraffes, the rest of us mere mortals, struggling, weak, mere mortals. Please have patience with us, giraffes, you self-righteous ones. Some of us are still growing and being established in Christ. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 30, there is a generation that is pure in its own eyes. What is that? That is what? That is self-righteousness. There is, yet it is not washed from their filthiness. So your eyes can't see when you are filthy, when you are dirty. You are pure in your own eyes. That is a distorted, blind eye. Pure in your own eyes, but you are filthy. You can't see it. The next verse. There is a generation. Oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids. Your eyes are lofty. Your, eyelid, your eyelids are lifted up, but you cannot see your own filthiness. Then you need to have the enlightened eye. That's the eye that moves in the spirit. The eye that can see. Psalm 19 verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. And those are the eyes that we should have. And how do we get those eyes when we fill ourselves with the word of God? Joshua 1 verse 8. We should meditate on his word day and night that we may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then we shall make our way prosperous and we shall have good success. It is a heart that observes the statutes of God. And the statutes of God bring order, direction, and the fear of the Lord. The statutes of the Lord bring correction, instruction, and wisdom. Oh, Barcelona, you know, I can never stop talking about wisdom. I can never stop talking about wisdom because if, if you have wisdom, you have it all. That is why all Solomon asked for was wisdom. That's all he asked for. If you have wisdom, you have it all. Then finally, we should have the eye that is fixed towards God. Psalm 25 verse 15. Psalm 25 verse 15. Do you have it up there? Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. When your eyes are forever, when, when your eyes are trained, focused, fixed on God. He says he'll pluck you out of the net. There are some of us who are stuck in the net. Some of you, you always come and ask for prayers. You know, my things are not moving. Where are your eyes? I feel trapped. I take a few steps and then I find myself going a few steps backward. Where are your eyes? <laughs> Where are your eyes? Are your eyes fixed on men? Are your eyes fixed on your boss, fixed on your job, fixed on your money, fixed on your business? Where are your eyes? Mine eyes are ever 
toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. And when your feet are plucked out of the net, you are able to move freely. And when your eyes can see clearly, you are able to move and avoid all the pitfalls, avoid all the dangers, as the Holy Spirit leads you, as your eyes can see clearly. So that's what I pray you'll have. Bazalwan, those of you who've come tonight. Holy Spirit, come and take your place. I love the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Let's stand up and sing that song just as a prayer even as I close tonight.
Heavenly Father, doors of opportunity will be open. And above all, Father God, that they would be established on the solid rock, on the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they would be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit of God and that the Spirit of discernment would be resident upon them. And so I pray, Father God, that you would cover them with the blood of Jesus as they travel, Father God, back to their various places of residence. Those using public transport, those using their private vehicles. Heavenly Father, bless this church. Bless this hub. Bless the hubs that are represented here. I ask all this in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, I say, put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow, what a blessing. Thank you so much, ma'am. What a word. How many of us enjoy the word of God tonight? Hallelujah. May God anoint your eyes with eyesalf tonight. Amen. I pray that you meditate upon this word. If I was you, I would be watching on Facebook again. Watch this message again. May your eyes be anointed with eye salve. May God change the way you see in the name of Jesus. Why don't you lift up your hands one more time and say, Dear Lord Jesus, help me today. Anoint my eyes with eye salve that I may see in the name of Jesus. Amen. One more time, let's put our hands together for our mom. What a word. Hallelujah. May God help us. May God help us tonight in Jesus' name. We have been thoroughly blessed, mom. Thank you so much. I feel so empowered. I feel so refreshed. Amen. Hallelujah. So grateful for the message that you have shared with us. We also want to thank you, every one of us that came through today. Hallelujah. Can I allow mom just to be taken to the uh, office there. Please put your hands together as we allow man to go. What a word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wish she could have just continued on and on and on and sharing the word of God. The word of God is powerful. Amen. May you receive the word of God with faith in your heart. Mix it with faith. Let it benefit you. Let it change you. I hope and pray that you were not shoveling to your neighbor as the word of God was coming. Amen. For me, the temptation was very high, Senior Pastor Gundu, to shovel it. <laughs> but I receive it all for myself in the name of Jesus. The word of God must be received. Mix it with faith and let it benefit you. Amen. Receive the word of God with gladness, even if it's a rebuke on you. Take it in the name of Jesus Christ. And let the word of God benefit you. Let the word of God change you and transform you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I enjoyed the word of God so much tonight. But we have to go home anyway. May I say thank you one more time for coming. Senior Pastor Matura, thank you so much. Senior Pastor Nari. So please help Mom, Mom Matura to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the office there as well. Thank you so much for coming. Please pass our appreciation to Rev Matura. I know he's not around. Please put your hands together. Mama Matura, Pastor Nariswa, Senior Pastor Nariswa as well. Thank you so much. All our pastors, thank you for coming. All the saints from all the churches, from all our churches, thank you so much for coming. May God bless you richly. Pastors, can I just see you here, all our pastors, just for two minutes? If you're traveling, please don't travel alone. It's now night. Travel with somebody. If you need help with transport, talk to your pastor. He will be able to help you. Just lift up your hands. Let me speak a blessing as we go. Father, we thank you for the word that we have received tonight. We declare the blessing of God upon your people. May they go in the peace of God. May it be well with them. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Pastors, can I just talk to you? Will